Well, hello, my name is Maria Florencia Roca Gonzalez, a qualified technician in vegetable organic production and the founder of Crop School Channel. Today we are with Kate Rolls, a writer and one of the Forbes 100 leading environmentalists in the UK. Nice to meet you, Kate, and welcome to the channel. Thank you. It's really lovely to be here. I would like to begin the interview by asking you the following. What sparked you to undertake the epic challenge of cycling the entire land of the Andes? <laughs> It's a really good question. Um, I've always really loved riding my bicycle in mountains, despite the fact that I've never been particularly athletic. I've always been drawn to mountains and I've always loved riding my bike. And I've also always been a passionately concerned about environmental and animal welfare issues. And I started to wonder whether I could bring those two things together and use adventurous journeys to help raise awareness and inspire action on some of our most urgent environmental challenges. And that over the years has evolved into the idea of Adventure Plus. And in fact, the life cycle journey was the third one of these. I rode from Texas to Alaska, uh, following the spine of the Rockies, looking at climate change issues and wrote a book called The Carbon Cycle. And then I was lucky enough to do an amazing voyage with Pangaea Exploration on their big sailing yacht looking at ocean plastic pollution. And then this voyage, um, this voyage, this journey, as you know, was focused on biodiversity loss and was in South America. Building your own bike for such a demanding journey sounds impressive. Did you face or can you share some challenge that you faced during your uh, this process? Yeah, I mean, I'd never built a bike before, but I thought it would be uh, really useful to build it myself. And then I would be able to look after it better when I was on the journey. And also, I really loved the idea of building a bike out of bamboo. I mean, there was something very coherent about doing a journey for biodiversity on a low impact bike that used to be a plant, right? So I love that concept. And I actually went on a course in London by a group called the Bamboo Bicycle Club, and they teach people how to build bicycle out of bamboo. And I think the most challenging bit is when you first arrive there and there's a pile of bamboo in front of you. We managed to get mine from the Eden Project in Cornwall so that it was it was locally sourced. And it's this pile of canes in front of you and you think, oh my goodness, <laughs> how on earth do I turn that into a bicycle? <laughs> and what's this bicycle going to be like? It's a bit like, I don't know, choosing a puppy out of a litter. You don't really know what how it's going to evolve. right? And then you have to learn how to use all of these different kinds of machines for cutting and sanding. And, um, and then you have to learn how to assemble the whole thing. So it was a very steep learning curve and very interesting and, and definitely challenging at times. Um, can you tell us some of the most uh, unforgettable moments about your journey? You know, that's a really hard question because the whole thing was extraordinary. I mean, I was cycling for 13 months and I traveled through six different countries and I crossed the Atlantic to start the journey on a cargo ship, which reduced my climate change emissions very, very significantly. If I'd flown, it would have been about two tons for the return flight, and the cargo ship reduced it to 50 kilograms. And that was actually a really interesting and exciting part of the whole adventure. I'd never traveled on a cargo ship before, so that was amazing. And then when I started cycling, I mean, I think the highlight was just the sheer diversity of different landscapes and habitats I went through, starting with the Caribbean coastline and then climbing up over weeks into the high spiky white mountains of the Peruvian Cordillera Blanca. And then the contrast between, for example, the rain and cloud forests, which of course are hot and humid and really bursting with life, the contrast between those um, habitats in the Atacama Desert, for example, or the Bolivian salt flats. 
which are really hot and really dry and much less life lives there. That was that was extraordinary. So witnessing all the changes um, under my wheels, as it were, as, as I cycled through these different places and countries over such a long time frame was just spectacular. Your book, The Life Cycle, highlights the concept of biodiversity. Why do you believe that the variety form of life is so important? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's interesting. I mean, we're losing biodiversity loss at an extraordinary rate. The WWF, World Wildlife Fund, estimates that we've lost 69% of our populations of wild animals since 1970. And the United Nations recently published a report that said 1 million species are now inevitably going extinct. So we're losing biodiversity at an incredible rate. And yet most people don't know as much about biodiversity loss and why it matters as they do about climate change. And the reason it matters is that, well, apart from the fact these are other life forms that are every bit as entitled to be on the planet as we are, but it also matters from a very pragmatic point of view, because biodiversity, the diversity of different species and different habitats gives us ecosystems and ecosystems give us these so-called ecosystem services. And they are things like fresh air, <laughs> clean water, yeah. pollination, fertile soil. I mean, things that, as you know, we literally cannot live without. So biodiversity is, is absolutely vital to our lives and to the lives of all living things on, on the planet. And yet, as I say, we're losing it at this horrendous rate. So I really, really wanted to use my journey to be able to highlight the importance of this as, as an issue and what can and is being done about it. Oh my goodness, I don't know where to start with that one. I met so many amazing people on my journey. There are people across the length of South America at every level of society, from very grassroots right up to, I met somebody, a Peruvian senator who was working at government level on biodiversity issues. And the projects themselves are very, very diverse. So many are to do with uh, forestry generation, for example. Losing forests and other habitats is one of the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss. And often that in turn is driven by big agriculture um, and you know agriculture taking down trees in order to grow crop crops. So many of the projects were working uh, with the farmers. Sometimes they were big industrial farmers, but sometimes they were much smaller local people who often had no alternative um, but to cut down forests to grow food for themselves and their families. And so many people I met were working on um, alternative rural income generation, on community engagement, on supporting small scale farmers into growing organic cacao or organic fruit and veg that they could actually um, sell for enough money that they wouldn't need to cut down the trees any longer um, or, or move away from beef cattle. Beef farming is one of the primary drivers of forest loss across across South America, in the Amazon, obviously, but in other parts of South America too. So there were those kinds of projects. I went to a school, a primary school, whose entire curriculum was based on turtles, which was amazing. Yeah. amazing. And the kids had a relationship with the local aquarium as well. So they did turtle maths. If the turtle is swimming this far for this long, how far does she go? And turtle creative writing. But then they learned about the turtle's lifestyle and they helped release um, captive bred turtles across a beach that they had cleaned of plastic and helped those baby turtles to get back into the sea. So that was an incredibly powerful experience for those young people. And then at the other end of the scale, I, um, I started to meet an increasing number of people that were trying to defend their ecological communities, their local habitats and their local human communities against big mining. And this was quite unexpected for me. I didn't expect to be end up talking about mining as a big problem in relation to biodiversity, but it turns out it is. And so, for example, gold mining ends up releasing mercury and other toxins into the soil and water for thousands of years after the mining has finished. 
and is absolutely deadly to the local ecosystems and also, of course, prevents any agriculture taking place. So that whole story took me on a, on a completely new tangent where I learned a lot about the extractivist industries and what their impacts are on biodiversity, on wildlife, on water. support biodiversity every day? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think the most important thing is to know how important it is and to understand what's happening to it. And then to ask yourself, okay, what can I do? Anyone who has a garden can help support um, nature-friendly gardening locally where they live. Anyone with a garden can help increase the wildlife in that garden not use pesticides, not use herbicides, grow wildlife friendly um, plants and flowers and so on, feed the birds, support bird life, support insect life. That's really, really important. So that's on one level. On another level, anything we consume as, as, as people, anything we buy has an environmental footprint of some kind. So trying to consume less but better and particularly staying away from things like uh, beef that's been uh, grown on rainforest, cleared rainforest, that's really important. Um, supporting organic farming as much as possible. The more food we can grow ourselves or the more we can support farmers who are growing food in insect and wildlife friendly ways, that's, that's super important. And of course, we're citizens as well. I mean, we can volunteer our time, we can support our local wildlife trusts, and we can tell our politicians that we really care about these issues and we want to know what action they're going to take. So there's lots, lots we can do and it will depend on how much time and what skills any particular individual has. Ha has. But I'm absolutely sure that everybody can do something on this issue. The Andes is tough. Um, did you face any extreme challenge that says your determination on to keep to keep going? Yes, absolutely. I mean, most of the journey was wonderful. I mean, most of the journey I was just grinning from yes. every day. Like, oh, I can't believe I'm here. I'm meeting such amazing people. I'm seeing something new every day. I'm on my bike in these extraordinary environments. But occasionally, of course, it would get very tough. So, for example, in Bolivia, there was a section where I wanted to get to this particular national park, which had these amazing colored lakes. They were naturally colored with pinks and orange. And on the lakes lived about 10,000 flamingos. So you can imagine it was spectacular. Yeah. And it was really important, super important from a biodiversity point of view. It was an international site for wetland birds. So I really wanted to get there. But to get there, I had to cross this park and it took me four days. And the roads were horrendous. It was gravel and it was thick gravel. And I had to push my bike for most of it. And it was at altitude and it was there was a headwind and at that at one point i did actually throw the bike down and cry and say i can't go on any longer <laughs> but then you sort of look around and you think mm, well what are you going to do so of course you pick up the bike and you carry on but that was one tough point and i think the other really tough point was in patagonia the the headwinds in patagonia are legendary and sometimes the winds are so strong, you literally can't stay on your bike. So making forward progress is really, really difficult sometimes. So that that was that was really challenging. But overall, as I say, um, I just loved it. And it was such a privilege to be able to take a year off and, and just and just go and be somewhere else and have these amazing experiences. A diverse landscape must be incredible. And how did it change your view of biodiversity? Do you know, it was really amazing to be literally cycling through what I was studying. I mean, I was trying to find out more about biodiversity and, and it was unfolding right in front of me. So cycling through those diverse landscapes that I described earlier, 
really made me realize how amazing our planet is and what an extraordinary range of different habitats and ecosystems we have on our on our planet and then when you're in places like the rainforest for example it's so alive there's so much life all around you you can really feel how valuable it is you don't need to study it intellectually you can feel it um and of course being outside on your bike all day you get much more connected with nature and you and you do experience the value of, of nature and of biodiversity um experientially as well as intellectually so i think that was that was really important to me i mean i i understood the issues intellectually but to really feel them and to come back even more motivated to pro help protect these places and these other species was just tremendous <music>